Hi, I'm Rachel White with the Horizon League here with Milton Katz, who is the author of Breaking Through, John B. McClendon, basketball legend and civil rights pioneer. Um, so as we prepare to really have our annual Coach John McClendon Day here in the Horizon League, wanted to catch up with Milton and hear a little bit more about the book and Coach McClendon and what makes him such an important figure to know about. So really first question for you, Milton, what interested you in writing this book and really telling John McClendon's story? Uh, Rachel, um, as you know, sports has always been a powerful force for social change. And that's what John McClendon was about. When I moved to Kansas City with my wife in 1974, I started attending the NAIA basketball tournament. So it's a small college tournament held annually in Kansas City and noticed that a number of the historically black colleges and universities have won the tournament over the years. So I was interested when that first occurred and about the integration and national tournament competition, I met Al Dur, who was the executive secretary of the NAI back then. And he introduced me to John McClendon. And he said that in fact, it was coach McClendon that made this all possible. The more I learned about John McClendon, the more impressed I became uh, and others would of course have been impressed as well of all the accomplishments, not only integrating that tournament but doing so many other things to break down racial barriers. So John and I became good friends. Um, he called me his little brother. I was probably one of the few shorter people than him in the basketball world. He was only five foot six. I'm a little bit shorter than that, but we became good friends. I, I did a number of interviews with him over about eight hours, over several years. Um, and then he and I wrote a small booklet together on integration in the tournament that was published in the late 1980s. John passed away in 1999. And um, to my surprise, no one had written a book about him. So he's one of the unsung heroes of not only the world of basketball, but the civil rights movement. So that's what prompted me to write the book. Awesome. And as I mentioned, the title of your book labels Coach McClendon as both a basketball legend and a civil rights pioneer. Can you talk about how he was able to really use his role in basketball to help bring about social change? Uh, he did, as you said, um, use his role in basketball to bring about tremendous social change. A lot of that came from his father, but also Dr. James Naismith, the inventor of the game of basketball. Um, John studied under Dr. Naismith at the University of Kansas. Dr. Naismith not only became his advisor, but a mentor to him. And one of the things that Dr. Naismith told him is that basketball needed to serve a lot larger purpose. It needed to change individual lives and people's lives collectively. And so John really at a very young age when he was in college decided that he would use his role in sports in basketball in particular to try to do that, to live up to, to Dr. Naismith's expectations. So I'll just tell you a few things that he did um, at the University of Kansas when he was a student. He, he was one of the he was the first student, the first black student in the physical education program, graduated from University of Kansas in 1936. But one of the requirements for the PE program was to be a, a good swimmer, to pass the swimming test. John was an excellent swimmer. In fact, he was a lifeguard, but he was denied entrance into the pool because of the color of his skin. And John, of course, didn't take this lightly. He jumped in the pool one day they emptied the pool. He said, I'm coming back the next day and do the same thing. You're gonna have a heck of a water bill. So he had a good sense of humor as well as incredible courage. And he and Dr. Naismith with Dr. Naismith's help integrated the pool at the University of Kansas, which was no small feat at the time. So early on in his education, John really used his passion for basketball, his passion for sports to bring about social change. And he went on from the University of Kansas and did so many things. And I'll just mention a few, and we can go into them later if you want. But uh, he started his coaching career at Lawrence Memorial High School in Lawrence, Kansas, won the Black High School Championship that year. Again, he was about 22 years old at the time, went to North Carolina College for Negroes, as it was called back then, in Durham, North Carolina. And while he was there for 12 years, he won that um, that conference championship, eight of the 12 years, but also importantly, led his team as coach in a secret game against Duke Medical School in 1944. And 
it was um, illegal for blacks to play white uh, athletes at, in Durham, North Carolina, to be on the court together. So it was a clandestine game, a game of civil disobedience. John's team not only played that game against all white Duke Medical School, a very, very accomplished team, but beat them 88 to 44. Uh, after he left North Carolina, he went to Tennessee State University in Nashville, Tennessee, and not only integrated the national tournament in Kansas City, the NAI tournament, but also won three consecutive national championships in the late 1950s. He was the first coach of any color in basketball to win three consecutive national championships. Uh, after that, he broke more barriers, so he keeps uh, the story keeps on going. Um, and he coached in post-collegiate competition in the National, National Industrial Basketball League. This was in Cleveland, Ohio with the Cleveland Pipers. So he was a black coach of an integrated post-collegiate team, the first. He won championships in, on that level when it became a professional team in the National Basketball League. He was the first black professional coach, even though most people think it it was Bill Russell, who of course was the first black coach in the NBA. John McClendon, not known to many people, was the first black professional coach in basketball with the Pipers in 1961. Um, after that, he coached at, a, at another uh, historically black school, Kentucky State University. But later on, we can talk about, and I know one of the things you're interested in is when he went to Cleveland State University. But also, before I forget, uh, not only did he integrate national tournament competition in Kansas City in the NAI tournament, but he also at the same time, as importantly, integrated, he and his team integrated Kansas City hotels and restaurants. They were the first black team to stay in Kansas City hotels and restaurants in 1954. He told the NAI that he would not come up to Kansas City unless they could stay in the same hotel as the other teams and be treated with equal respect as all the white teams. And that happened and he deserves tremendous, he and his players deserve tremendous recognition and credit for doing so. Wow, just an incredible impact he had. It's crazy just how little so many people just don't know about John McClendon, but you did mention, obviously, um, he gets hired eventually at Cleveland State, which is a Horizon League institution, which was very significant at the time. Can you talk a little bit about why that was such, such a big moment when he was hired at Cleveland State? Uh, in 1966, so at the height of the civil rights, the modern civil rights movement, of course, in the United States, uh, the president of Cleveland State, um, I never met the gentleman, but I have a lot of respect for him. Uh, his name was Aaron Nissen. E-N-A-R-S-O-N. And he decided that in fact, that he wanted to break through a barrier and have a African-American coach, obviously John McClendon, be the first coach of a predominantly white university. What was interesting about that is that Cleveland State had recently become a public university. And they had, if, if you don't mind me saying so, a pretty pathetic basketball team. Didn't have much of a tradition in sports. The team that John inherited had won four games, only four games the year before. So John McClendon took on a challenge. He was an award-winning coach. <laughs> he had won so many games and he took this team, which had only won four games that made them respectable. Uh, John coached there for three years. His total record at Cleveland State was 27 wins and 42 losses. But again, they became respectable. One of the things that John McClendon was promised when he took the job at Cleveland State, which was, again was a pioneering effort, is that he would have a new field house to coach in. That didn't happen for 25 years. So though he was promised it would be immediately, it took 25 years to happen. But again, John did the best that he could there. One of the interesting tidbits about his tenure at Cleveland State is that um, during that time, John McClendon won his 500th victory. And John McClendon was known for revolutionizing the sport of basketball with a fast break, but there was no shot clock back then. And the team that they were playing, Walsh College in Ohio, decided that they would stall. That's the only way they could beat this team from Cleveland State. So John won the game, believe it or not, 
24 to 22. This is a man who pioneered the fast break. His teams at Tennessee State were, large, were most of the times scoring in the 100s. Their championship teams in, 19, in the late 1950s averaged just over 99 points per game. So ironically, he wins his 500th victory with a 24 to 22 score. But again, his time at Cleveland State is very, very important because he sets, he breaks through a barrier. He becomes the first African-American coach of an integrated team, shows that he can be successful. His, his players are of course, black and white. He has actually about half of each on his team. So certainly racially integrated and they have tremendous respect for him and play their hearts out. Again, they only won 27 games over three years. But in fact, that's the forerunner of the Cleveland State team that later plays in the NCAA tournament. So John has a second uh, tenure at Cleveland State. So after he leaves the university, he coaches for a brief time in the American Basketball Association. And then he takes a job at Converse Shoes Athletic Company and becomes their um, international ambassador for the sport of basketball. And he does that for about 20 years. So back in 1989, John and his wife are in Cleveland and he accepts a job at Cleveland State University as both an advisor to the athletic department and an adjunct teacher, a part-time teacher. One of the interesting stories about his tenure at Cleveland State in the 1990s is that um, a, one of the girls is writing for the student newspaper and she wants to interview Coach McClendon. And she says that I hear people call you the Jackie Robinson of basketball. So John's a very humble man. And he says to her, well, in fact, I'm really flattered by what you said, but can you tell me a little bit what you know about Jackie Robinson? And this girl says to him, I know very little. So at that time, John decides to teach a course, which he does for almost 10 years at Cleveland State. And it's on the history of sports and the role of minorities in its, in its development. And it's an incredibly important course. Uh, Coach McClendon actually shares the syllabus with me. It's very, very impressive. And he teaches that course actually a couple of days until a couple of days before he passes away in 1999. So he has a, two legacies at Cleveland State. One is coaching the team from 66 to 19. 69 and the second one is as an adjunct professor and an advisor to the basketball team in the 1990s. Awesome. Now let's talk a little bit about his legacy today. Where can we still see the impact of Coach McClendon in this game of basketball in society in general? Uh, Coach McClendon's legacy is profound. Um, and I think a lot of people are just beginning to understand that with a lot of development. So we can talk about that in a moment or two, but his legacy is really on two levels. One is in sport of basketball. So he revolutionizes the sport of basketball. A lot of this goes back to his time being mentored by Dr. James Naismith. So there's a story, a brief story. I'll tell you that he and Dr. Naismith are walking one day um, in Lawrence, Kansas, and they notice some kids playing on a basketball court. And they, they have one basketball, of course. And every time the ball moves, every kid on that court runs after the ball. So there's very little discipline there. They all know they should get the ball. So Dr. Naismith says, young man, do you see what's happening? They all run towards the ball. Ba basketball is a sport that should be played from baseline to baseline, constant motion. And a matter of fact, the sport of basketball, as some people know, was played at that time, just the opposite. Most teams were scoring in the, in the 40s or 50s, no one was approaching 80 points per game or even 100 points per game. So John learns the idea of the fast break from his mentor, Dr. Naismith. So he revolutionizes the sport, not only with the fast break, which it becomes almost a science for him, but also with the pressing defense, which is revolutionary at the time. And he invents the four corner stall offense, which Dean Smith takes and makes very popular and in credit and credits John McClendon for, again, giving him this idea. So he revolutionizes the sport again on the court, but his legacy is also, of course, off the court. Because John McClendon 
does not let segregation, institutional systemic right segregation get in his way. He breaks through those barriers on so many levels, not only in winning those three consecutive tournaments, integrating national tournament competition, he plays a key role in also integrating the NBA. Just two quick stories. One is the he brings two young men up to tryouts at the Washington Capitals in 1950. One of those players is from his team, um, and he be, Harold Hunter. He becomes the first player, black player, to sign a professional contract. The other is a a black player from West Virginia State, Earl Lloyd, and Earl Lloyd becomes the first black player to actually take the court in an NBA game in 1950. John was not alone in prompting, pushing the NBA to integrate, but he was certainly a forerunner in that and played a significant role. So he plays a role not only in integration, both collegiate and professional basketball, but also the first black coach of an integrated team. So he opens that up for other black coaches that are coaching obviously on the collegiate professional level today and in athletic administration. So his legacy is profound and Kenny Smith does a, a, um, a short piece on John McClendon in 1998 on a show which becomes very, very popular called This Week in the NBA. It's on the Turner Broadcasting Network. And Kenny Smith makes a comment that every player, no matter what the color of their skin is indebted to John McClendon for what he did for the sport of basketball, not only on the court, but off the court as well. Not only every player, but every coach is, in, is really indebted to John McClendon for breaking through that barrier when it was so difficult to do that in the 1940s and 1950s and beyond. We've obviously talked a lot about just the many, many accomplishments that um, John McClendon was able to achieve in his time. But what's something that you wish more people knew about him and, and what he was able to accomplish? Um, John McClendon was a remarkable man. I mean, my respect for him just grew every moment I was with him and certainly after he passed away as well. Uh, he was a man of a remarkable courage, fierce determination and had the moral strength to really break through those barriers, and not only as a young student at the University of Kansas, but every year beyond that. Um, and again, I think a lot of that comes from his father, which at least Coach McClendon told me about, and certainly it comes from Dr. James Naismith. So they instilled in this young man a belief that he could really change the world and break through the bounds of institutional racism. So that, that's his primary legacy. And that's what people need to know about. Not only was he a great coach, but he was a remarkable human being. And it also shows you that there are so many unsung heroes. I mean, it's true, everyone knows, or most people, I should be more humble in that. Most people know the story of Jackie Robinson. So, and, and we honor him appropriately for what he did in the sport of baseball. But it's interesting in basketball, most of this story is, was not known. John passed away in 1999. And very interestingly, John and Will Chamberlain, that most people certainly know a little bit about and maybe a lot about, uh, had a very symbiotic relationship. So both attended University of Kansas. John in the 1930s, obviously, Will Chamberlain in the 1950s. Uh, Will Chamberlain went to see John McClendon's Tennessee State team win his first championships in Kansas City in 1957. So they met briefly. Back then, they were both inducted in the Naismith Memorial Hall of Fame in 1979. There's a great picture in the Kansas archives, which is in my book, and it shows Wilt Chamberlain standing behind John McClendon. And so you look at this picture of this seven foot man and John McClendon, who is five foot six, and you think that, that Wilt Chamberlain's the father and John's the son. In fact, in reality, it's the opposite. John is in fact the father to people like Will Chamberlain and others. So they were inducted together, but ironically and meaningfully, they passed away in 1999, one week apart. And there was an incredible article, an incredibly meaningful article in 1999 after they passed away in the Springfield, Massachusetts newspaper. The Hall of Fame, of course, is in Springfield. And what the article says is everyone knows about Will Chamberlain 
and has mourned his passing. The Will Chamberlain was a great man and a great pioneer and certainly changed the game of basketball. So everyone mourned his passing. Very few people mourned the passing of John McClendon. And what this young reporter said about John McClendon is that with his passing, not only did the sport of basketball lose its last link to the inventor of the game, obviously Dr. Naismith, but in fact lost a large piece of its soul. And it's just a beautiful, just a beautiful capture of what John McClendon not only meant to the sport of basketball, but it meant to American society. So his legacy is felt today. Certainly every time a student, a player, be a professional player, collegiate player, be he or she black or white, protest racial injustice. Every time a coach like John Calipari, for example, at the University of Kentucky, Mike Krzyzewski at Duke University, Lavelle Martin at North Carolina Central, where John, of course, coached many years ago, every time they stand up against racial injustice, they are echoing the words of John McClendon. So everything that is happening in our world today, especially in the United States in the last couple of years, goes back to people like John McClendon. He's the one who opened that door to make these kind of protests against injustice possible. So his legacy is profound. What's also interesting is that the University of Kansas is honoring him today like never before. Certainly they did honor him a little bit before, but thanks to a friend who's a professor there and myself and a number of other people, University of Kansas is opening its doors to John McLennan and actually dedicated a plaque just several months ago to the, at the swimming pool where John McLennan jumped in as an 18 year old young man back in the 1930s. So they dedicated the plaque to all he has been at the university. What's really important is that John McClendon in the early 70s, so he's retired from coaching at that time. He is nominated five consecutive years for the, to be inducted in the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame. So from 71 to 76, five consecutive years, each time he is denied. It's important to note that John McClendon at that time was the fourth winningest coach in collegiate basketball the fourth winningest coach in collegiate basketball. There is no question whatsoever that he would have been inducted in the Hall of Fame as a coach, except for the color of his skin. He was, a couple of years later, he was inducted in the Naismith Memorial Hall of Fame, not as a coach, but as a contributor. But in fact, things do come around. They take a while, like Martin Luther King said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. So the arc of the moral universe took 50 years in this case. But in 2016, John McClendon, posthumously of course, was inducted as a coach in the Naismith Memorial Hall of Fame. It's important to note that Coach McClendon is the only person in the Naismith Memorial Hall of Fame inducted as both a contributor and a coach. And then you also mentioned, so just one more brief thing about the Theodore Roosevelt Award. The NCAA denied entrance to the historically black colleges and universities back in the early 1950s. They said that their teams weren't good enough. They don't, they don't measure up against white school competitions, which of course the white schools could not play the black schools because it was illegal in the South. So they never could in fact have a chance to measure up. So the NCAA said, no, these teams aren't good enough and their coaches aren't competent enough. So John McClendon went to the NAI, as I mentioned before, and broke through that barrier and won three consecutive national championships. Then, of course, the NCAA opened up the doors to the Black athletes and the Black colleges. So it is ironic, but also incredibly just and historically important that the NCAA decides to bestow the Theodore Roosevelt Award on John McClendon. I think it was just last year. It's the highest honor the NCAA gives, and they gave it to John McClendon. So it just shows people are recognizing him, as you said, in a way as never before, and he so richly deserves it. That's awesome. Well, again, thank you so much just for sharing all those great stories about Coach McClendon. We hope that 
everybody watching this learns just a little bit more about him and his incredible legacy to the game and to really just to our country as a whole. So thank you, Milton. Okay, thank you, Rachel and Horizon League. Thanks so much.